All right, so what we are going to do is, are all of the parent functions, and you have to know them by their name. So that's like a word, uh, their equation, and then drawing a graph. So I've given you the equations here, and we're going to fill in the other stuff. And again, I'm going to question you and see what you remember. And obviously, if no one remem remembers, I'm going to tell you the answer. I'm your teacher. That's what I'm going to do. But I just want to see what you guys thought. So are there any on the first page that you remember what they're called, it, like the name, like a word? There we go. A lot of the time they are exactly what they sound like. Like that's the one with the absolute value. All right, and let's plot some points. What does the graph look like? It's a V. And we're doing the parent functions. So they haven't been shifted around or anything. So it's gonna start at the origin. So you're gonna have a point at zero, zero. And then the slope of each one of the like lines is going to be one. Well, one will be one and one will be negative one, but it's up one over one when you go to plot the points. All right, cool. Are there any others on the front page that you remember what they're called? All right, sweet. Five is quadratic. All right, and what does that one look like? Yeah, a parabola, good, a U shape. So you wanna make the V shape and the U shape look different. Um, first of all, the points aren't in the same place, but for absolute value, it's like a sharp edge and for quadratic, it should be a nice smooth curve. So again, starting at the origin, so zero, zero, and then you'll have one, one, and two, four, and then the same points on the other side. All right, what other ones on the front page? All right, square root. So quadratic and square root are inverses of each other. So you're taking the parabola and turning it on its side. The only thing is you don't get the graph. How come it couldn't be this? Like that's wrong, but I'm asking why. Good, why is it not a function? This is what I missed about teaching in person because online you don't get like I can see you and you're going I know what you mean because it fails the what there we go okay so you're only going to end up with half of the parabola so it would be the you know the parabola on its side it's just you only get the upper half of it so we get zero zero one one four two and it's just half of that. So these two are inverses of each other. It's just, you only get half of that graph because otherwise it would be. Right, any of the other ones on the front page? We got three more. Yes, good. Um, so just a basic line with a slope of one. It's really one X. So you're gonna start at the origin and have a slope of one, which it's the absolute value graph um except the negative part stays negative like i want you to make a connection between these these are the same thing it's just for the absolute value this negative part is forced to be positive you guys see what i'm saying there yeah. like so it's a really kind of the same there all right two more I know I know what it is. <laughs> no, I know what it is. Yeah, like a bug. Wow. Shut up. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Well, going along with kind words only, we need like good attitudes only. So no more, I'm gonna fail and stuff like that. All right, constant. Now I wrote, I wrote f of x equals two, but it could be f of x equals seven or f of x equals negative 14. Like it's just a number without a variable. There's no x, lack of a variable is constant. So since this one's two, it's gonna be a horizontal line at two. Um, but again, it could have been any number I just picked. And then this one with the double brackets is called greatest integer. And I feel like some algebra two teachers cover it and some don't. So like half of my classes always come in knowing it and the other half don't. I really like this graph though. Um, it's also called the step function, but it's like steps. So you're gonna start at the origin with a closed circle and you're gonna stay on that step until you get to one and it ends with an open circle. And then you hop up to the next step and it's like this infinite staircase. And everyone's always like, oh, that looks really weird and it makes me uncomfortable and I don't like it. But it's actually really applicable to real life. For example, if you're gonna go to like a museum or a museum, they're gonna do a class and then they're gonna do some clever out of it. Okay, but they're not chosen. So the thing is, it's so tricky, you're gonna have to do it for an hour, you use it for four minutes, okay. An hour, you use it for an hour and four minutes when you come up with it. You jump over to the next step and then you stay on that step and you come up with the next step. That's how that works. I used to use phones as an example, but now we all have unlimited everything, so that doesn't work anymore. So now I say you're renting a truck. All right, next page. We're going to have to speed this up a little bit. What do you think? All right, seven is cubic. Yeah, and then eight is cube root. And just like quadratic and square root are inverses of each other, these two are inverses of each other. Um, what does the cubic graph look like? Like, what do you call that shape? I'm always interested, but everyone calls it something different. Yeah, I call it a wiggle, it's like this thing. All right, so you're gonna have zero, zero, one, one, and two, eight. Two cubed is not six. Please, for my sanity, let's get that. Two cubed is eight, right? Two times two times two. All right, and then you're gonna have the negative points. So negative one, negative one, negative two, negative eight. And then for cube root, you're gonna reverse those points. So it's gonna be sideways. You're turning the graph on its side. The other way people sometimes remember which one's right side up and which one's sideways is they'll say the sideways ones are roots like a tree, like the square root and the cube root are the sideways ones because the roots of a tree grow out sideways. I don't know if that helps at all, but I've had that work for some people. Nine and 10 are the same kind of graph. I put two examples on there so that we can There we go. I can't tell who's answering you or saying anything because I can't see your face. Was that you? 
Okay, that's what I thought. Um, again, I put two of them on there just because I've found that when I only do one, it's like not enough. Everyone's like, I kind of got that, but not quite. These are the ones from last year. Do you remember, does it bounce back? Does it cross straight through or does it wiggle? And it's like a pattern. I like these because it's like doodling in math class, okay? First, you're gonna put the zeros on there. This one is gonna have a zero at three because three minus three is zero and negative four because negative four plus four would be zero. So you put the zeros on there. Let me zoom in for a second. And if you don't see a negative out front, then the right side is going up. So if it's positive up, negative would be down, but it's the right side. So I usually just put like a little arrow there, like the right side's gonna go up. And then you pretty much just connect the dots. But if there's a power of one, it's gonna cross straight through. If there's a power of two, it's gonna bounce. It's like a quadratic. And if there's a three, it's gonna wiggle. All right, so when we get to the three, that comes from the factor that has a three in it, okay? There's no power on that. So it's understood to be a one. It's just gonna go straight through. And then when we get to the negative four, that factor has a power of two, it's squared, so it's gonna bounce. So when you get to that, it's gonna look like a parabola. Did that come back to you slightly? You do cover that last year. Yeah. Oh yeah, if it's power of one, it's gonna cross. That's like linear. A power of one is the line. A power of two is like a quadratic. Squared means it's gonna be a parabola, it's gonna bounce. And three is cubic, so that's a wiggle. And again, I put another one on there so we could just try that again. Um, so where is this one gonna have an x-intercept? Good, negative four and five. And I stuck a negative in this one, so the right side's gonna go down. Again, positive means up, negative means down. And then you just basically play connect the points, but you just have to do what it says. So when you get to the five, comes from the factor with five in it, that's cubed, so you're going to wiggle. So when you get to that point, it's gonna look like a cubic graph. And then when we get to the negative four, that factor is squared, so it's going to bounce, It'd be like a parabola. And then I always get asked like, well, how far up does this go? Like how far up should we draw? I don't know. It is good enough. It's like a vague sketch of a graph. That's why I like these, it's like you're doodling. It's cool. Like this one, how far, how far down does it go? No idea. I mean, I could figure it out, but not worried about that. All right, these two are the same type of graph as well, same name. Nice. I always ask, what's the root word of rational? It's not ration. Ratio, which is a fancy word for fraction, by the fraction, okay? These ones, I'm not picky about points. You don't have to plot any specific points, but you do need the asymptotes. Do you know those dotted lines, those like invisible fences? Okay, so they're both gonna have them on the axes, which is hard to see because it's on top of it. Sometimes people like to use a highlighter for those, but you can dot that in. They're gonna be on the X and Y axes. And this one, the parent function, the one over X, I always say it looks kind of like an hourglass, or I don't know if you have a better suggestion for what this one kind of looks like. Do you remember that sort of? I always say it looks like an hourglass. What have you got? What does it look like to you? Or is that good? Yeah, right? Like, <laughs> looks like a rational graph. Um, and then the one that has the squared in it, just both of the arms of the graph are positive. They're above the x-axis because when you square something, it's gonna be positive. All right, almost there. Thirteen and fourteen are also inverses of each other. 
What is 13 called? It. Because the variable is the exponent. And then this one's logarithmic. So again, for right now, not like super picky about you know points on these, but exponential is gonna have a horizontal asymptote. And it's, I, I call it a swoop, it's gonna do something like this. Be good. And then logarithmic, you're turning that on its side. Again, they're inverses. So it's gonna have a vertical asymptote and it's gonna be like that. And then these last two are new for you. Or, I mean, you've heard of sine and cosine, right? But just probably not their graphs. Um, so these are sine and cosine. That's exactly what it sounds like. They are waves. And all you have to do is remember where they start. And I've already you know, scaled these axes by pi over two. We're gonna get to this later in the year. For right now, I just want you to remember which one's which. All you have to be able to do is identify them. So it's pi over two, pi, three pi over two. And so on and so forth. Sine starts at the origin. And then it does this wave. It goes up and comes back down, goes up and comes back down. It's gonna be this like infinite wave. Let me draw it on here and move my hand so you can see it. So just remember where it starts. Sine starts at zero, zero, and then it does a wave. How do we feel about that? I know that one was brand new to you. Or have you seen that before? I don't know, have you? I wouldn't have expected you. And then cosine starts at zero, one, and then it waves. So if you just remember where they start, then you'll be okay. All you have to be able to do is identify them, that's it. We're just identifying things right now. So sine starts at zero, zero, cosine starts at zero, one. Those are all the graphs, you survived. Yay. The last thing we're just gonna review lines real quick. So this is like back from algebra one. Hi. All right, so slope. What letter stands for slope? Because it's not S. Yeah, good, M. And it's rise over run. So it's going to be your Y values over your X values. So you're going to subtract Y values and then subtract your X values. So you have two points, you just subtract. You can subtract, you're gonna be fine. Honestly, like memorize this so much, but just be able to use it like with actual numbers. All right, and then there's two forms of line, point slope form. You need a point and a slope. So it's Y minus your Y value equals your slope and then X minus your X value. Again. People look at that and go, oh my gosh, there's all this, these symbols everywhere and it looks really confusing. Don't get hung up on that. As long as you can use it with actual numbers in it, then you're fine. And then what's slope intercept? That's the one everybody always remembers. Yeah, Y equals MX plus B. And B is the Y intercept. All right. So 17, and I might skip some of these because 17 and 18 are pretty much the same. I'll fill them in and, and post them later because since they took 10 minutes from us, I'm not gonna be able to finish this year. All right, so slope, you're gonna subtract your Y values. So it'll be seven minus negative two, which will make it plus two, subtracting the Y values, and then subtract the X values. So negative one minus two. And if you feel like you wanna label them, like if that helps you, then do that. If it doesn't, then don't. Because that's from algebra one. What was that like three years ago for you guys? Yeah, it's been a while. That's why I'm reviewing it. But is that like, you remember that? Making our algebra one teacher proud? Okay. Uh, so what is that gonna be? Nine over negative three. So negative three.
All right, so point slope form, you can pick either point you want. I just always pick the first one because it's the first one. It does not make a difference. It is gonna be y minus the y part of the point, which is negative two. So it's gonna end up being y plus two. So y minus negative two equals your slope, which we just found is negative three, and then x minus your x value. So I used this point and the slope. Hey, Ms. Cole, what about this point? Well, you had to pick one or the other, and it doesn't matter which one. And then to turn that into slope-intercept form, you just need to rearrange it. We're going to distribute the negative 3. And then subtract over the 2. So those are your two forms of the line. And so when you go to graph it, you're going to start at 0, 4. This is your y-intercept, so 0, 4. And then how would I do a negative 3 slope? Like, what am I going to do to do a negative 3 slope? Because it's down 3, but then you have to go over 1. Good. Eighteen and nineteen are the same exact kind of question, and I tend to do that on the notes. It's like put more than we need on there. I'll fill them out, and when I post this, they'll be there. So if you're like, "Hey, I needed an extra example," I'll post them. Um, let's just jump to twenty. That's backwards. I gave you the graph, and I'm asking for the information. So looking at number twenty, what is the slope? You have to, you know, look at the points that I plotted for you, and see how much up and how much over you went. It helps if you draw in the triangle. So what is that slope? Yeah, two over five, you go up two over five. So two fifths. And then your y-intercept is just where it touches the y-axis. So that's negative three. And so it'll be y equals two fifths x minus three. That one's easier because you don't have to actually graph anything. All right, 21, when you go to do this slope, when you subtract the y values, you're gonna have negative three minus negative, so plus three over negative six minus five. Well, what's that gonna come out to? I know everyone's hesitant. Yeah, it's zero over, and it almost doesn't even matter what the denominator is, that's just gonna be zero. It's going to be a horizontal line. You're going to have a zero slope. It's constant. But how do I know where to draw it? Where is the constant graph going to be? Yeah, exactly. Yes, the y. Good. Negative three. So you're just going to draw a flat line at negative three, and that's it. Now you're like, hey, you skipped the equation. It's just going to be y equals negative three. And I know that looks like not much of an equation, but that's all, it, the y's are always negative three. No matter what point you pick on there, y is gonna be negative three. And then you probably know what's coming with the last one, because if I just did a horizontal line, I'm gonna give you an example of a vertical line. When you go to do this slope, you'll have nine minus one over four minus four. This time the zero is in the denominator. And look, guys, I know people mix these up all the time. You can't divide by zero. So this is the one that is an issue. So what do we say that slope is? Okay, good, it's undefined. So this one's zero and this one's undefined. It, it is like the most commonly mixed up thing ever. And I totally get it, one's one way and one's the other. But this is gonna be a vertical line at four. And so what's the equation gonna be? X equals four. Did your teacher give you an acronym to remember them? Because there's a common one. Did your teacher tell you Hoivux? 
So horizontal lines, zero slope and their y equals, vertical lines are undefined slope and their x equals, if that helps. If it doesn't, then forget it, but one's one way and one's the other, so you gotta remember it. 